Hi, this is Saqib Rahman from the OrthoClips podcast series. And today I am with Dr. Eric Gochin, who's an associate professor of orthopedic surgery at Temple University. And he's the director of foot and ankle surgery in our department and colleague of mine. And today we're going to be talking about Achilles tendon ruptures, surgery or non-op. Thanks, Eric, for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Great. So um, let's just start off with um, talking about what are the current controversies with management of Achilles tendon ruptures? Well, the main controversy is really deciding whether to do surgery or whether to treat them non-operatively. Uh, in the past, it really wasn't much of a controversy because historically the non-operative treatment had a re-rupture rate of about 12% compared to 3% with a surgical treatment. And uh, really it was pretty straightforward who was going to have surgery, almost everybody, and who wasn't. Um, and at that time, our treatment was putting them in a long leg cast and immobilizing them in Aquinas for prolonged periods of time. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, we want to treat our patients based upon science and not theory. Um, and so there were scientific studies that were done, uh, which were animal studies that, rec that revealed that there's significant tendon healing that's much better with range of motion versus treating them with immobilization. And then researchers decided to start using this on uh, human studies and the outcome studies started showing superior outcomes with functional rehabilitation compared to the immobilization that we had done. And so now it makes that decision between surgical versus non-surgical uh, much bl more blurry and difficult to decide. So um, what, kind of, what kind of data do we have? Is it strong? I and mean, what does the literature teach us about this uh, issue in particular about uh, operative versus non-op uh, here in 2020? Well, I think there was really uh, a landmark article that came out in 2010 in JBJS uh, written by Willits, and it was operative versus non-operative treatment of acute Achilles tendon ruptures. It was a level one randomized controlled study. They had 144 patients that they followed for two years. And what they found at the end of the two years was that there was no difference in re-rupture rate between the two. Uh, and this is treating with the functional rehabilitation compared to surgery. There was a slight improvement in plantar flexion strength in the surgically treated, but it wasn't really clear if it was clinically significant in that difference. And the other big difference between the two, though, was that the complication rate was 18% for the surgical patients and only 8% for the non-operative patients. Since then, there's been uh, multiple studies that have really corroborated the findings that they had in that study. And what we found is that most of the studies also show no significant difference in re-rupture rates. There's a slight increase in um, improved function in some studies that appears to be kind of on the early side. And there's also some suggestion in some meta-analysis that uh, they may be able to return to work or return to sport uh, two or three weeks earlier with the surgical treatment. Um, but all of them uh, confirm that there's a higher complication rate in the surgical cases. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's an important study for those who want to look that up. Um, how about something more practical um, for the listeners um, in terms of tips? What are your, what are some of your tips to managing these successfully with non-op methods? Maybe, um, you know, you can think about a few examples or something like that, or, how do you? How are you successful when you when you go with rehabilitation? Yeah, I think what we have to realize is functional rehabilitation is not doing nothing. Uh, it's actually uh, very specific, but you want to make it simple so the patients can follow it because it's a progressive treatment um, algorithm. So what I tell the patients is that they go for two week intervals where they progress their weight bearing. So the first two weeks they're non-weight bearing, which is really, I think, just because it usually hurts to walk on it. And if they can put some pressure on it early, that's fine as well. But two weeks of non-weight bearing, followed by two weeks partial weight bearing, and then two weeks of full weight bearing in a cam boot that has heel wedges in it. And the heel wedges are about two centimeters in height. Um, and you tell them to put their weight on their heel and they'll figure this out. Most of them can tell right away if they put weight on their toes. You don't want to say toe touch weight bearing because if they put weight on their toe, then that 
activates the Achilles and that actually causes pain. So if they put weight on their heel, they actually can walk without pain. Um, but most importantly is they also have to remove the boot and do range of motion exercises up to neutral um, around four times per day at least. They can do more than that if they want as well. So it's actually not difficult to do. And I found most of my patients are actually pretty reliable. You know, we have a patient population that can sometimes have some issues with compliance, um, but I've not found that to be much of an issue with this. Uh, and they all seem to be able to follow this pretty easily. Okay, great. What about um, tips for managing these successfully with operative methods? I mean, um, and you can talk about the range of stuff uh, in terms of patient selection, and, uh, as well as operative tips, uh, how you do it. Um, so yeah, what, what are your tips for, for success when you fix them? Well, uh, traditionally, people have been doing an uh, open technique, and uh, the open technique is still fine. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of pointers that I learned over the years for uh, repairing it with an open technique. You really want to try to get the uh, um, minimize the suture bulk, and so there's a technique that's called the gift box, tex gift box technique that allows you to uh, um, keep the sutures away from your uh, uh, repair. Um, or the knots really away from the repair. Um, and then also a, a nice little trick is you'd like to get that peritinon over top of the uh, repair. Um, so you have that extra layer of soft tissue between the skin and the tendon repair. And one of the ways you can do that is after you've repaired the tendon is slide around the tendon anteriorly and split the uh, peritinon anteriorly lengthwise and that frees it up so that then you can pull it around posteriorly and get a less uh, stressed repair over top of the tendon. Um, and then uh, I actually have switched to doing a mini open technique, which uh, I think had grown from the percutaneous techniques that have been developed in the past. People began developing percutaneous techniques to try to minimize the risk of the wound complications. Um, but there were a lot of issues. It was really not as uh, reliable as an open procedure in terms of getting your sutures in good position. And so a few manufacturers have developed uh, some jigs that you can use. And uh, um, once I started using this, I found uh, much better outcomes, not to mention quicker surgical times. Um, and so it basically goes through about a two centimeter incision and you pass a jig that has paddles that go deep to the peritinon, which helps to lower your risk of injuring the sural nerve because now your suture is gonna all be underneath of the uh, peritinon. And then it has outriggers that allow you to pass sutures through the skin um, and through the tendon. And it has a system set up so that you can actually get locking sutures as well. And then these sutures come out of the, that small incision. And then what I do is I use swivel lock anchors uh, into the calcaneus. So I pass the sutures down there using uh, suture passers. And then basically you end up with a, a knotless repair. So you don't have to worry about your knots untying or any bulk from the, the thick uh, sutures um, around your uh, surgical incision. Um, there was a study that was done by Grassi and JBJS in 2018 where they compared a mini open versus open. Uh, it was a meta-analysis with 352 patients. What they found was that uh, between the two procedures, they had the same re-rupture rate, which is good. Um, but they also showed less complications, shorter OR times, and similar or even sometimes better outcomes in the mini open versus the open. Um, and in my experience, I've really found that these patients, when they come back for follow-up as they heal, uh, the tendon really feels and looks more like a normal tendon. When you do the open procedures, a lot of times you get this big bulky scar that's around the tendon. Um, but when you do these mini open, uh, the tendon really feels and looks like a normal tendon. Um, and the patients, in my experience, seem to be getting better faster as well. Um, and then a couple other pearls for the procedure. When you do the uh, mini open, pretty much everybody's saying, put them in maximum plantar flexion when you tighten down the uh, uh, suture. It seems like they stretch out and get their full motion back pretty quickly. 
Um, and then for post-op protocol, I use the same post-op protocol as I use for the non-operative treatment, which is very simple and easy and the patients can follow it quite easily. Okay, that's some great tips. You know, um, I will definitely need to look into that anterior, uh, from what I'm hearing, anterior longitude, almost like a relaxing incision in the anterior peritoneum to allow it to come back up over the top. I've certainly been in many cases where you think you opened the peritoneum pretty nicely and uh, you just can't get it to close so nicely at the end at that critical spot right over your... Uh, where you tie your sutures. So um, that's a nice one. And um, I'll certainly have to look into the mini open. Not sure that's something you, you do a lot more of these than I do. They come your way. But um, uh, that definitely sounds intriguing, uh, the, the mini open technique as well. I know many, many uh, other mini open techniques have come and gone. Um, so that sounds nice that that's working for you. Maybe we'll finish up with um, perhaps if you can give um, maybe a case example um, that illustrates your decision making here. So maybe like a borderline case. I think many of us would agree if you have an elderly patient with bad diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, perhaps uh, you know someone who's not particularly active, um, you're worried about wound complications. Um, and if you have a patient who walks into your office and is very athletic and is insisting on surgery, um, you may not have a good argument uh, to go non-op, but you know the study you pointed out certainly was not on you know elderly non-ambulatory patients. I mean these were you know reasonably athletic patients who you know they truly uh, decided to go one way or the other, and uh, with functional rehab worked out. But if, can you give a maybe a case example of maybe a borderline case or some you know something which you know, forces you to really think about a lot of uh, these principles you brought up and ultimately deciding how to go about it. And then what one or two things might change uh, your decision? Uh, which factors might change your decision? Sure. Um, I think the most important thing is to make sure that you really explain the risks and benefits of either avenue, whether you're going to do surgery or treat them non-operatively. Um, you know, we always do that with all of our patients, but in this case, I really take quite a bit of time, particularly for those gray zone patients, you know, the weekend warriors, to really go over the pros and cons of uh, each treatment with them so they really can make an informed decision. Because I think this is one where the patient really does need to make the decision because you can go either way. And everyone has different expectations and levels of risk. And you know, I think we in our minds think right away, oh, this person definitely needs surgery. Um, but then sometimes that's not what they want. And so I remember a, a specific patient that I had was a semi-pro football player in his mid-30s um, and had been playing football for years. And uh, he had it came in with an acute rupture. And I thought for sure, this guy's going to want to have surgery. And I explained to him all the things that we just talked about, the benefits of surgery, and uh, for somebody that's really athletic. And he said, you know what? He said, I think I'm going to just retire after this. I think I'm done with this. And he said, I don't really want surgery. So I want to go non-operatively. And uh, so we went ahead with the non-operative treatment and he did great. I mean, I haven't followed him for two years to see how he's doing, um, but he recovered fine um, on exam. His tendon looked wonderful. He had uh, really good strength by the time I discharged him was able to do a single stance heel raise without any difficulty um, and was really happy with his outcome. Um, and so, you know, it really kind of caught me off guard, but it's just a, a great example of how we need to tailor our treatment to the desires of our patients. Um, and, uh, you know, even somebody that's older might say, hey, I want surgery because I, I uh, you know, sometimes in their mind, they just feel like this is the way to go for treatment. Um, and as my example pointed out, sometimes a really active person may decide not to do surgery. So I think the key point is really to have a good discussion with your patients so that they understand the benefits and risk of each treatment option. Yeah, that's a really good example. Um, and, you know, I, you know, there's something when I have this discussion, um, 
you know, with the, um, our, you know, we're in Philadelphia, of course, I, uh, I do remind patients sometimes that, you know, even in the, you know, the highest level athletes um, who get, you know, access to uh, excellent medical care, uh, wound complications and infection um, still occur. Uh, this is an area that uh, we take very seriously with uh, regard to that concern. Of course, in every patient you have that discussion, you know, infection, wound issues, all, you know, these are all bleeding risks, et cetera, with any surgery. But um, this is one of the reasons why, you know, we still kind of um, discuss uh, very seriously, you know, a, a non-operative treatment course. And um, yeah, again, in being Philadelphia, I'll remind patients, I don't know if you recall Ryan Howard, who had an Achilles tendon rupture in that, I think it was the last at bat of the season coming out of the batter's box, had an Achilles tendon rupture, had surgery, and he got infected. Yep. Uh, and that really affected his rehab. And, and there's some people who still remember that, they certainly remember Ryan Howard. So it's just a reminder that uh, it's a humbling, uh, it's a humbling uh, problem to treat. Uh, you treat enough of them and, you know, these can be pretty devastating problems sometimes. So, well, I think, um, I think we covered that uh, pretty well. Um, again, our topic today was Achilles tendon ruptures, surgery or non-op. And we talked about a few other controversies as well. Uh, my guest was uh, Dr. Eric Gochin uh, from Temple University. Um, Eric, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Sok. Sok, I would appreciate the ability to join with you.